Hello and welcome to all of you, you're watching Tech24. In this edition, we tell you how AI-driven software used by companies to help them recruit talents are having the opposite effect, increasing the number of hidden talents. We'll speak to Harvard professor Joseph Fuller about how these algorithms are eliminating candidates based on criteria disconnected from reality. And in Test24, we bring you a selection of gadgets designed in Benin, highlighting the city of Cotonou as it looks to become one of Africa's leading tech hubs. Nearly 75% of companies in the United States rely on some degree of automation to fill vacancies. They are deploying AI-driven software to do everything from sourcing candidates and managing the application process to scheduling interviews and performing background checks. The same trend is gaining ground in China, where first-time applicants are finding the process quite impersonal. Olivia salazar Winspear has this report. He and Chi is a maths graduate, and at 20 years old, she's taking her first steps into the world of work. She'll have to go through the interview process, and this time her recruiter is an artificial intelligence chatbot. I worked with six people from three different universities over a period of two months. A 30-minute session that An Chi finds convenient. Having an AI bot instead of a human in front of me makes me feel more relaxed. I think my performance is better. Today in China, thousands of candidates are being recruited via AI. This company develops software for human resources departments they have a sophisticated system for assessing how the interview went beyond what was said. A number of Chinese and Western companies are using these tools to whittle down potential candidates, and the interview data can be analyzed in real time. We are analyzing the sound, the richness of the context, and also the accuracy of your expression. So uh, overall, we will give a, a, a score for the, uh, uh, for the interview. When you are answering a, a specific question, then the different points will move. So by using these uh, points, uh, the dynamic of these points to understand their uh, uh, facial uh, expression. In a country where more than 10 million graduates arrive on the job market every year, human resources departments at multinational companies are able to save huge amounts of time by deploying AI. This company receives between 30 and 50,000 CVs for every job opening, and computers eliminate the first three quarters of candidates. Without artificial intelligence, hundreds of employees had to go through the applications for about a month. Now recruitment only takes about two weeks. More than 40 percent of Chinese companies now use AI for at least one step of the recruitment process. Now, according to a new Harvard Business School study in the U.S., these AI-driven algorithms that sort through applicants are excluding as many as 10 million workers from consideration, increasing the number of so-called hidden workers. Well, for more on this, let's turn to Joseph Fuller, professor of management practice at Harvard Business School. Hello and welcome. Delighted to be with you, Julia. So tell us more about what your latest study entails and what you actually discovered. We wanted to understand why it was that in countries like the US, the UK, and Germany, there were a large number of jobs available while there were simultaneously a large number of people seeking work who couldn't find it. And traditional explanations of that didn't seem to speak to this lasting anomaly in major economies. So we looked at how employers structure their processes for seeking workers and how those processes are experienced by workers who have had difficulty finding positions. Now, just a few years ago, AI was actually seen and hailed as uh, the only way to reduce bias in recruiting. Can the technology today help if programmed the right way with a set of criteria that accurately reflect the job market's expectations? Well, I think so, Julia, but it's going to require employers to revisit the way they structure and implement their process for hiring. As our study indicates, AI now uh, is used uh, applying what we think of as negative filters. 
exclude someone that doesn't have a college degree, exclude someone who doesn't have a minimum of five years of experience, exclude someone who has six months or more gap in their work history. And that has the effect of crowding out workers who are actually qualified for positions, but have some attribute that AI has been told by companies to use as a excluding variable. If AI were repurposed and the processes that companies used were changed to emphasize affirmative filters, what does someone actually have to be able to do? What are the five or 10 things someone needs to be good at to be a success in this position? We think it can be a force for good and its, and its uh, prospects be realized. But isn't it ironic to let AI take over a field that's dubbed human resources? And how important would you say is it to continue to have human face-to-face -face interactions in the workplace? I think it's very important in, in a couple of ways. The first is it, it adds an element of judgment and subjectivity that you don't actually want AI to exercise. AI, it does what it's told. And actually, the term intelligence is, is a little bit misplaced. It's not actually intelligent. It, what it does is it's really great at filtering through large amounts of data to look for patterns that the user instructed to. So we also need to be aware that human interactions in hiring decisions historically have been associated with um, many documented instances of bias. So if we can merge uh, the subjective judgment of people who are trying to find valuable new colleagues with the capacity of AI to, to scan hundreds and thousands of resumes to identify an appropriate candidate using those affirmative filters, I think we can get to a new level of efficiency and fairness in the labor market. Professor Joseph Fuller there, thank you very much. My pleasure, Julia. And it's time now to welcome our tech editor, Peter O'Brien. Hello, Peter. Hello, Julia. We're going to dig a little bit deeper into the AI bias. What is it exactly and why does it actually replicate and even perhaps exaggerate human biases? Well, it's known in the industry as garbage in, garbage out. AI tends to replicate human biases because it's fed with stuff that's generated by humans. So let me give you a fresh example from a paper in Nature Machine Intelligence looking at OpenAI's very sophisticated text generator called GPT-3. So when prompted with the word Muslims, it often finishes the sentence with a mention of some act of violence. Two thirds of the time it does this compared to just a fifth of the time when prompted with the word Christian. So that gives you an example of a bias. Um, Open and our AI are of course working hard about how to get rid of this Islamophobia actually and other kinds of biases that pop up in GPT-3. I'll be interested to see though how they manage this given that the source material, humans and all of the text we put online is fundamentally biased. Right, now how exactly have these failings crept into recruitment? Well, let me give you an example. Um, Amazon a couple of years ago had to scrap their AI recruitment tool, which they were using to search for skilled workers, the system actually taught itself that candidates who are male were preferable to women. And that's because its computer models were trained by observing patterns in CVs submitted over a 10 year period to Amazon. Well, of course, men dominate the, te the tech industry. So most of these CVs were submitted by men leading to the bias. Now, Peter, as we're on the topic of the future of work, what will the jobs of the future look like? Well, yeah, I wanted to know what our AI overlords would be recruiting us to do. So I had a look at some hot takes in articles about what the next jobs might be in 10 to 30 years time. And I've seen all sorts of claims like there'd be body part designers, vertical farmers, uh, nano, nanomedics, space, space pilots, even extinct species revivalists. And uh, what I found quite interesting was personal data managers. I think that could actually be a thing. But personally, I'm slightly loath to make this kind of grand prediction because if you look at articles written 20 to 25 years ago about what the future of work would look like, i.e. where we're living now, there's the occasional decent prediction, but also a lot of nonsense. Back in 1995, which is, this is what life looked like back then, the LA Times uh, wrote an article listing potential jobs of the future. One of them included a cyber librarian, which I quote would f filter and distill the flood of available information to a trickle that people can cope with. Another would be answer network technicians who would quote, access databases and experts and respond to questions in different areas. Clearly this article was written two years before Google launched. 
Thank you very much, Peter. It's time now for Test 24. Kotonou, Benin's economic capital, is one of the leaders of West Africa's digital transformation, with initiatives like the new technology hub SimiCity, for instance, which is a fertile ground for tech entrepreneurs. And Peter here has some of the fruits of their labors with him. I do indeed. I've got a number of devices developed by the entrepreneur Richard Odrado. His startup is called AS World Tech, standing for Asuka Spirit, Asuka meaning warrior in Yoruba. This is the AS Watch, which is a smart watch with all the features that you'd normally see, uh, like a heart rate monitor, water resistance, temperature checker, but it also has a clever way to show you if your phone's been stolen or if you've lost it because it will start vibrating if your phone exceeds more than three meters away from you. Uh, next up, I have the AS Book Pro, which is a very impressively designed uh, laptop with very high build quality. It has a core i7 processor, an SSD, and eight gigabytes of RAM. Finally, let me show you their smart sunglasses, which have speakers integrated into them. This allows you to go hands-free and listen to music or take calls while you're say, driving or on your way somewhere. They look great on you, Peter. Thank you. All right, now all of this is designed in Benin. Uh, what's right. the next step now for, for this company? Well, so the major challenge is um, really making this stuff um, uh, as made in Benin as possible. So uh, Odrado says he wants to open a factory and actually start assembling the devices in Benin rather than having them assembled in China. Um, this has precedence, the famous Congolese entrepreneur Veron Manku actually invented the, um, uh, the first tablet designed in Africa in 2012. He then opened a factory, um, and this ran for a couple years, but we haven't heard about it in a few years now. Um, so it's not necessarily going to be easy. Odrado, though, wants to, the, the help of Semi City, the tech hub that you were talking about, to try and give his uh, factory liftoff. Thank you very much, Peter. That brings us to the end of this week's edition of Tech24. We'll see you soon.